I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm so happy to have everyone in attendance. Crest Fest is rolling right along. This is our fourth event, and we're very excited to have two amazing speakers here. Before I proceed, I'll introduce myself. My name is Melissa Malskoon. I'm co-founder of the Crest Network and one of the hosts of the Crest webinar events. My co-host is Lorna Quant. And we're so excited to have these events for you to participate in. Before we proceed, let me give you a visual description of myself. I'm a white woman, blonde hair and a ponytail with black glasses, using, uh, wearing a blue Crest Fest 2021 t-shirt. We are thrilled to have with us Dr. Julie Hoke Sang, as well as Dr. Corinne Okino. They will be having an informal conversation talking about documenting language use in ASL communities. And I'm sure you've already watched Julie's presentation online. It was a fascinating discussion on this topic. And now the two of them will talk a little bit more about and have a discussion about what they talk about every day. Also feel free to type your questions in the Q&A feature and continue to use the chat box to talk amongst yourselves. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Julie Hoaxang. I'm a white woman with short brown hair. I'm wearing a black top with a gray background, and I have tattoos on my arms that are visible. Hi. I'm Corinne Okino. I'm also wearing a black short sleeve shirt. I have medium made brown blonde wavy hair and pink glasses. We're thrilled to be here today. Okay, so I guess now we'll have our sort of casual conversation. It's sort of like our weekly meeting for our research projects. So I think we can just go ahead and talk about what we normally talk about Absolutely. on a regular basis. This is an awesome opportunity to talk about this topic. And all the panelists so far have been incredible. The topics have been really varied in talking about ASL documentation and file organization. I hope everyone also had the opportunity to watch Julie's amazing presentation. And it's posted on YouTube and it's been up for a while. And if you haven't had the opportunity to watch it, I really strongly encourage you to find that video and see what she's been talking about and working on. So from Julie's talk, I was able to select out a few topics and I'd like to expand upon a few of them that she didn't actually have the opportunity to talk about more in depth in terms of documentation and collaborations in technology. So I guess what we'll open is with one topic that comes up with documentation work is sustainability. And how can we as researchers or documentarians and also tech people ensure that we'll have data that endures and is accessible for as forever. How can we achieve that goal? That is a great question. And think, something that we talk about often. We have people in the audience who are doing this work. Hello to everyone who is here. I know that we won't be able to cover everything today, but I wanted to share some things that would might stimulate discussion. First off, there's no one thing or no one sure solution. And it's more about language documentation, 
documentation and technology is all about human behavior. Humans are involved. And so there's no one way to do it. It should, it should reflect our current values, our practices, and our current technology. I just made a, phono a phonological error. <laughs> Corinne and I are famous for discussing those. Uh, there were some Easter eggs for you to find throughout this presentation. There's no one solution. Again, it's more about continual reflection and engaging the community. One thing that's very important to us is being interdisciplinary, not just having people from technology or linguistics, but gathering an interdisciplinary team, not only an interdisciplinary team. I mean, when we're, talk we're talking about language documentation now, it also means observing the community's use of language and involving the community as well. The community should be leading these efforts. It's important to make sure we continue to pull a team together that can talk about solutions. Language documentation today in North America have developed principles based on Force 11, also the Austin principles of data citation where they've listed several things to think about for citing data. How to make the original data and that information accessible. Could be something simple like having a clear file name, making sure that everything is granular, can be identified, and having metadata embedded with the overall data we're we're thinking starting to think about how to follow those practices now. Implementation will always change. So it means it needs to be an ongoing conversation with this interdisciplinary team in the community. I agree. And I think it's just even just important important to be thinking about these factors that technology changes and what we assume is the current state of the art, so to speak that that would endure over time and not making the assumptions that that will remain the same. We want to be able to reflect on what we've already learned and be able to predict where we're going and finding that balance and finding the best practices for what's right for this current moment, having an eye to the future and to be thinking about what kinds of evolutions we might experience with technology. I know many people in the audience might be old enough to uh, know about things like floppy disks, right? I mean, that's the way we used to have data storage where you would put a physical floppy disk into a computer. And at the time, people were not thinking about what data storage might look like, generate and the different iterations of that in the years to come. So if you've got data on a hard disk, you don't have a reader for that anymore. Computers can't access that information. And now we're working with newer technologies as technology always changes and evolves. And you can't necessarily account for every future adaptation, but it is important to be thinking these questions and having a plan for the future as we can't necessarily predict everything, but having that in the back of our minds, that technology will change and to be able to account for that in our plans. Definitely. I teach field methods and language documentation at Gallaudet University. And I am always telling the students, make sure that you have somebody else come in and look at what you've done with the data so that they can understand it. Because file names need to be clear. You also have readme docs. And it's important to update those docs to say, you know, it was set up a certain way. To have a table of contents that explains the, all of those elements of the entire data set. Yes. Or whatever you have. Also thinking about format, trying to tap into what's the most portable format. And obviously that will change over time, but there are certain things you can avoid. For example, don't use colors to emphasize information. Don't use different font size or bolding. It's important to not think about formatting, mm -hmm. but 
using things like plain text, using tags. For example, the work that I do in language documentation, we often use a program called Elon. This is a particular software where you can add a transcript to a video and basically add annotations. That program is built on XML. I'm not good at using technology or coming up with programs. And so, you know, a per, a, somebody who's from the tech field could explain that. But I know that XML has good, a good archival format, which is again, good for data sustainability. It's important to think about mobility and how you encode your data or your information. Yes, I agree. When it comes to metadata, having a plan for that too, because that's a very important element of your data overall. In my previous experience, I know what I'm, I'm doing differently now, but I would just go ahead and collect data as much as I could without thinking about what the future might look like. I would just collect a whole bunch of data and now I have this information that I can't actually do much with because it needs to be backed up and labeled in such a way that other people could benefit from it. So that's another thing to be thinking about. Other people who need to have your data tagged and annotated so that it's usable for them as well. You want to have your information to be discoverable and be thinking about what they're going to do and how they're going to be able to access it. And not just have information in a way that's readable to the researcher as an insider. Having that meta documentation with the data itself is a crucial element. And that also makes the data more sustainable. Agreed. And to add to that, it also helps with transparency. That's what we often talk about. Be clear about how you decided on what your practices were, which go back to ethical concerns, which today we know is so important to think about. Because you think about who tends to make decisions in academia and technology is a very specific group of people who doesn't always think about the range of experiences from a community. And so documentation, again, I'm not talking about language documentation, but project documentation, writing up a lab book or an article where you actually describe very clearly about the decisions that were made behind data collection, organization, archival, to name things you did. For example, I used iMovie to edit the films. I filmed through Zoom. I'm, I'm of course not going in order, but you understand what I mean about capturing all of that information, which is a critical piece of documentation as well. I'm seeing some Q&A come up, so I'd like to see what folks have written. This is a great from Athena Willis. She asks very specifics with regards to documentation. How do you know what's important to actually document and what can be disregarded in terms of finding a balance to keep as much as you need and to be able to perhaps get rid of some of the data that you don't need because there's so much of it. Striking that balance is really challenging. A great question, Athena. Thanks for asking. That goes back to the concept that we opened with is having a continual reflective dialogues. Myself, Ryan Lepic, and Corinne Okino often get together. And I think of the three of us as you know, trying to keep everything I'm not sure if you're familiar with winter versus lumper. Mm -hmm. The idea of I see all of the things and all of the things are important. We want to keep all of that. But of course, is it practical? Does it reflect what you're currently doing? So deciding on the principles and what the goal is, mm -hmm. and if it ties back into those goals. 
And what kind of metadata do you need about the sessions, about the people in those sessions, and about the technology? It's important to set that before you do any research. Right now, I'm doing a research project called MOLO, Motivated Look at Indicating Verbs in ASL. We're looking specifically at indicating verbs, for example, verbs like give and ask. We looked at what was important to our questions and our methodology. And then we made our coding logs based on that. And so we have a template log ready for every session, well, really for everything that we do that shapes our information and make sure that we capture yes. everything we need. It also leaves room for individual observations. Sometimes that's the whole point of research. You don't necessarily know what you'll find. And so not to just have a static template because that limits your view, but so that it's open-ended with some guidance, which will then determine what's important. Because what's important is subjective. It really requires a discussion and decision from the whole group. Yes, I agree. And you mentioned some very important pieces of the puzzle. Most of these decisions about what to annotate should be decided before you discuss your method section. And most people don't think about tagging and annotation until after the data is collected. And that can be dangerous because you have a goal for what you want from that data. It's not just a pile of data that you can do everything with. Your data collection should just be specific. Some people just do a mass data collection and try to just see what they find. You might be able to do a post hoc analysis, but it's really best to plan for what it is that you want to collect. And you might be able to find some new and unexpected things from that data, but the goal for the study should be decided before you work on the data collection. I think that's a really important piece. And also thinking about the current values, the current needs and the preferences of the language community. You'll notice in my presentation, I talked about ASL communities because there's not a singular language community that uses ASL. It's region dependent, race, gender, social society dependent, identity dependent. And so when you're thinking about making a record you have to think about what this says about the data that you're collecting and use that in a way that will help somebody else visualize the data. That's one thing with technology. It's there, we can capitalize on it, but at the same time, it's hard to build things, you know, that have the, the whole system that incorporates our values. But at the same time, maybe using it for something else is not going to work as well because it was designed very specifically by a specific group of people for this very specific research project and very specific purpose. And even another group of researchers or um, those who are using it for applications, they might need different things. That actually reminds me of positionality. And I've seen a few different signs for that position and ality. I've seen an international sign used like stand as well as perspective. And thinking about what that word means is that we all have experiences and behaviors that define who we are and then having that introspection as to who we are and what we bring to the research question from our own backgrounds. Many people think that science, linguistic documentation are neutral efforts and endeavors, but that's actually impossible despite how much we might strive to do that because we all have internal biases that we bring to the table, so to speak. So it's a question of not only knowing who we are and what communities what we're recording in our relationship with them, because people might think that, well, there's ASL. Why don't I just record some ASL because I want to do a research project? But thinking about belonging, thinking about community involvement as part of the documentation process is crucial 
And can you expand then about how your own positionality has really impacted your perspective, as well as people who are involved in technological fields more specifically and language documentation, how they might be able to be more mindful of who they are and how that impacts the work that they're doing. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Sure, that's a big question. So help me remind me to answer some of those individual components. First, this is a little bit tangential, but related, I promise. We have to think about archiving in general, archiving systems, language archiving, library sciences, any type of cataloging where we recognize name and label something and try and put it into some kind of organizational system. And I grew up fascinated in that process of organization. Always struck by people saying it's important to be neutral, objective, free of, not error, but free of bias. And assumptions. Mm -hmm. And I always thought to myself, but somebody came up with those systems. It's like thinking if somebody wrote a book, the, whatever they wrote in that book is true, but it's still written by a person. And humans make words, humans do discriminate. Mm -hmm. And so again, thinking about all of that being connected, that these systems, are created by people. People decided what to include, how to set up the system. And so it's just something that I've always mm -hmm. thought about through a variety of different experiences internationally as I've traveled nationally, as people talk about language use and how to document information. I'm from a hearing family. I was born deaf. And I went to a public school, both with other deaf children and alone as a deaf person, and then a deaf school later. And so I have a variety of different educational experiences and conversations about language within the community, thinking about who's right, who makes decisions. There's a lot of discussion about the real ASL happening from, um, deaf people who are born into deaf families. And I understand that that information has not been used and has actually been oppressed historically, but there's a variety of other language uses. There, most deaf people are born into hearing families. And so we have to think about the range of ASL use. That's so important. And it's a very personal thing for me. And when I see people talking about um, the fact that one person's language use is not real ASL, it gets to me. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's the point of as we, that even comes from ASL dictionaries, things that we've developed. People are selecting what's right. And just by incorporating those things into a dictionary, you're recognizing and elevating only one variety um, from a variety of language communities. And so that's something that I've been thinking about for quite a long time. It's so important to acknowledge that power and a history of oppression. Now we can't solve the issue of oppression. We, you are you, you are your experience, but by coming together, getting together an interdisciplinary team, bringing people from a variety of different backgrounds and experiences, people who are members of that, those communities who can lead the effort and open up the conversation. The problem with ASL communities in general, there's a lot of feeling, well, and I know that there's mm -hmm. an international audience today. So sign language communities in general mm -hmm. is that for the first 50 years, most individuals who published were hearing and had access to language often later in life. And so they would publish information and become famous off of, mm -hmm. the, off of the deaf community who had used the language their entire life. And so as a community, we're very wary about that. That's another thing to consider, how it is that we can center our experience as deaf individuals and how we can make sure that we claim that space for ourselves and make sure that 
Mm -hmm. Levi's talking about strategic centralism. Yes, I see that. The perfect description is strategic essentialism. And why is it important for technology people or people who are working with ASL and ASL communities to really recognize that? For us as researchers, we do recognize that. We really try to have that reflected in our work and our contributions to those communities from our perspectives. My experience is going to be very different than the people I'm working with and different members of sign language communities and deaf researchers are going to have different contributions that are not more or less valid. And many are functioning from an outside of the deaf community as an outsider who are involved in research. So we definitely want to talk more about deaf researchers and their experiences relative to what kind of research they might be interested in doing? I know that's a really big question and it's really loaded. And I just wanna talk a little bit more about why this is so important. People might think that this is, you know, minutia that why should we be so concerned? In so many discussions, Corinne and I are on Twitter a lot and we see a lot of discussions there from the technical field, NLP, computer science, that tends to look very narrowly at this issue, tends to see things in terms of a problem or an issue. They come from a logic or engineering perspective, which typically is very linear in their approach to solving a problems. First, we have to think, do we even perceive this as a problem? Well, from a deficit model, a deficit perspective. Mm -hmm. Right, coming from that deficit model. I see people talk about this on Twitter. The disability dongle. Just today, I saw, I apologize. <laughs> I'm gonna know I'm gonna sign her name sign wrong. I saw Marte de Miller, mm -hmm. Martija de Miller. She called it techno solutionism. That's when you remove humans from the equation. But that's the whole point. Language can't exist without people. Language is, language is all about use. I agree. And once you put language in a box, it's no longer language. You remove the human element. It's a little bit morbid. But thinking about you know, studying butterflies, when you take a butterfly out of its environment and you put it in a box, it's not a butterfly anymore. You can no longer see how it flies, how it eats, how it interacts with its environment and the world at large, and how it interacts with other butterflies or other species. You can only learn limited things about that butterfly when it's dead and in a box, which again is what we're missing. Technology is often disconnected the applications of technology are disconnected from the users. And there are many complex issues involved, but that's one of the biggest things is disregarding people and users. And people and users have to be central. Often the technology fields, academia, are people who are not deaf and they're coming from they're not deaf and they have had access to education or resources where the people that they're quote unquote trying to fix don't have that same level of access. And so of course their perspectives are going to be missing. And it's very complicated because language itself is very complex. And many people are now using the term embodied, which actually means a variety of different things depending on who is using that term. But for me, I think about it as how I'm connected to the discourse and how language emerges when I'm using it. It's not something that's found in a book that's static, 
that you can take from a dictionary that's just a frozen form, a static form. Language does not exist in that form. Language is dynamic and it evolves from its use. The interactions that we have with the communities with whom we work and live, that embodied aspect of ASL, it's not necessarily very different from spoken language. It's just the modality is different because it's visual as compared to auditory. So the uses for one might be different and the tools we use are going to be different for spoken versus sign language, but it seems that there's a lot of methodology that we're trying to take from spoken language and apply to sign language, whether or not it actually fits. Language being typologically valid different languages can have similar aspects to it. And we can look at what the similarities are. And at the same time, we can't just assume everything would be very similar despite modality. In early aspects of spoken language research, a lot of assumptions were made where romance languages were, and that framing of linguistic study was applied to indigenous languages that might not be romance-based or based on Greco-Roman or Latin roots. And the similar is true, where sign language might not necessarily be able to be researched with the fra same framing with which we applied our questions to spoken language, that empirical research, the empirical study, our assumptions about our approach to research are very much tied to who we are. And related to that, there's a lot of work, especially in technology, about the written tradition. And people who work with or live in ASL and signing communities know that sign language isn't written. There are written systems that people have tried to use, but they're not widely known. And so we have notations, which is a technical system of representation for uh, the phonological form, the shape of sign language. We do have a notation system but it again, doesn't work as well as it could in my opinion. And people also don't know those systems. So what that means is when we're studying sign language or representations or trying to do technical things with sign language, often we're using the written form to do that. And people don't often think about the effects of using the written form or that working from a translation, which is not ASL or the, the sign language that we're trying to study. We're missing that multi-channel information. We're missing the speed that the signs are produced. We're missing body and facial movements. We're missing prosody. And there are labels that we can put into the data for that, but we're missing an understanding of what written language does for spoken language. And the same concept is not true in sign language documentation. So for me, that's one huge issue right now. Yes, and related to those two questions from the Q&A that I'm seeing come up, what's the best approach to gloss a classifier or incorporate facial grammar and non-manual symbols? And what's the impact of translation interpretation studies with documentation efforts I think that's really related directly to what you both, what you just said, the assumptions that we have about how language works and also how we best approach documentation. 
Can you expand a little bit more on those two things in terms of gloss, facial expression? I know that's your favorite topics. Sure. Well, it's my favorite topic to hate. Some of you are aware that Carl Gorsell, he saw me talking about gloss at a conference a few years ago and he gave me the hashtag uh, Glocksang based on my last name, Hoaxang. So kind of a mashup of glossing and Hoaxang. But really that leads to my point. That was fantastic. We have to think about what glossing is and some of you are very familiar with it and maybe some of you are not. But glossing means it's a written language of the spoken language from that community used to represent signs. So often we use a close translation. For example, the English word to represent my sign, the sign language representation of two C hand shapes coming together is the word ball. That's a simple representation of glossing. Now that doesn't show the size of the ball, which I could do in ASL. So all of that information is gone when you're writing out a gloss. Most sign language resources out there, again, because of the limitation of technology and now with the fil filming and cloud-based services are starting to change some technical limitations, but our practices are still stuck in the past of written documentation. So a lot of the sign language resources are text-based where you represent sign language using glossing and there's no picture or video attached, which made sense of, you know, 70 years ago because it was very hard to capture that information with a static camera. But today everyone has a, a device, a mobile device that we can capture video on. It's ridiculously easy to be able to capture video, but we're still stuck in the past and reliance on glossing as a form of representation. And for many reasons, that's an awful way to do language representation. Now, doing that in conjunction with video representation is better, but your question about how to best represent facial expression, body movements, what is best is something that we haven't figured out yet. The current practices of using, not glossing, but ID, so identifying glossing, which has to do with the sign bank. And there are different sign languages that have their languages or a corpus, uh, either linguistic documentation or a corpus process, have the sign bank where they store these annotations. And those are tied to their transcriptions, which means the gloss then ties into both what you're representing in the video and is tied into the sign bank. And so you have a more abstracted form with some information about that form, which is current practices. In my presentation, I talked about um, some of the resources that we have online. But again, that's our current best practices. There's still an issue because it still elevates the written word as the end all be all and the way to access sign language information. And I wish we could flip the script that visual access was primary, but we're not there yet, which is again why we need to convene a team of members of the community, technical experts, where we can get to that point. But again, we're just not there yet. And so our best is something that I'm not satisfied with. We need that um, identifying information where we can make sure that it's kept together with the primary data. That means if somebody signed ball in the video, you would be able to see the original format as well as the identifying information. But it's not as easy to scan. It takes a lot more time. It's time consuming and requires high computational processing. But that's my answer to your first question. Mm -hmm. The second piece about translation and interpreting and how that all impacts documentation. I think that those fields get the need for representation and are often work closely with a variety of different consumers, 
interpreters, those who do translation often have to think about how to represent their clients best. And there's processes and principles and information there that directly impact language documentation and the building of a corpus. Again, there's a lot of overlap, the need and desire is again coming as part of those communities. I think the deaf community themselves is less aware of mm -hmm. those processes. And that's where social media, people are starting to talk more and more about language use, which is great. Yes, that's true. But they're often not thinking about the principles or standards behind language use. And so we have to then marry that with thinking about language ideologies, language patterns, and people who study that every day need to come together with other experts, um, put all that information together, which would truly be amazing. Yes, I think that relates to how power and oppression interact with our assumptions about language in terms of prestige, the prestige variety, what is considered worth documenting and what is considered insignificant. Yes, And we see that in terms of the choices people have made in the past about what is documented, what we have documented and what we don't have recordings of. Those are decisions that people made. And those decisions were based on ideas about who was or who are the keepers of language. So these are really interesting points and questions. Related to that point, when we're talking about ASL communities, we're also talking about visual ASL use. I see somebody in the chat mentioned that that's an important point about right now we're documenting visual ASL, which is based on a very small group of language users, often deaf of deaf, white users, uh, visual ASL users, and focus on the idea of, well, principles taken directly from spoken language, both in linguistic principles and technology principles. And we're trying to embed our systems into already existing systems. When we're saying we, you know, we're describing this, we have to be very clear about what's involved, what decisions have been made. And also language is not a product, it's a process. And when you think about language as a behavior, mm -hmm, it doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. fit that standardized form. I also have to think about multimodality. Yes. And the cool thing about that is that everyone does that. There are some strategies more preferred by a specific group of people for whatever reason, but at the end of the day, we all are embodied and how we communicate is embodied. And so we have to, we can't think about language as sign for sign or word for word, which is incredibly limiting. I agree hundred percent. Of course, I know we've had this chat several times. This is a popular topic of conversation for us. And I actually think this relates to another comment from an anonymous attendee that anthropologists are also documenting sign language and have practices working with deaf, deafblind, deaf disabled. Do we have experiences working with those people as well, those populations? And what kind of thought processes and, and what else can we learn from those dialogues? Yes, I know several several individuals, Bob Johnson, my advisor, was not a trained linguistic, linguistic, trained linguist, but an anthropologist. And so there are people who are working closely with those communities. Also, Tara Edwards works with Pro Tactile or the deaf blind community. And what I just said before about process and values, those are all of the things that I've learned from them. Language exactly. is not fixed. We can't put language in a box. And we can't just focus on the end result. We have to think about the entire process. And so what I've said before really comes from my learning of those, from those communities. 
And it's important to, to not just think about what the experts say, because a lot of language is not just produced by linguistics. Everyone uses ling language. Everybody has thoughts about these processes. So who's to say that we own that space? We really have to think about and dialogue about that among the communities. And I know that anthropologists have known that for a long time. I agree, yes. Many linguists don't include perspectives, the sociological aspect. The traditional aspect of language is that it's more devoid of people and context. That language is just for thoughts, expressing thoughts, and that is it. And had is more of a disembodied perspective. And that's, that's what technology been, does. Mm -hmm. It's a traditional approach. With sign language gloves, perhaps, that's an example of that. The thought that sign language gloves might be able to detect ASL, but really it can just register some basic finger spelling. And ignores the interactivity of sign language. So what about the interaction? Just identifying language isn't enough. You have to think about the interaction between two or more people. Yes, it's not just on an individual level. Now, related to the social aspect of language, Another question from Lori, why not? In terms of collaboration with community members and working with their own languages, it feels like an appropriate approach, but wondering about strategies for doing that. Should we be training the communities themselves, even though they are not trained linguists, but they're experienced users of the language who live that experience and communicate with their community. Is that the best practice? Or is there another model that we have in terms of what we should be doing when interacting with ling linguistic communities? That's a great question. We've talked about this a lot, as well as many of the experts in this field. When we think about language in and of itself, it's not easy because we use language to communicate, to indicate our identity. And often people don't think about the language itself. And linguistics takes some very specific training and language communities often are very small in terms of who can do that work. And so it's not always practical, especially if you're talking about technology in my work, we develop a corpus, which means we're collecting a variety of data and a huge amount of data for a variety of different purposes. It's very time consuming, labor intensive, and that is an issue. Well, Karin would often talk about crowdsourcing or consumer-based sciences, mm -hmm. citizen science. There's people who are developing apps where people who have never thought about we've got people who are developing these corpuses, but there are a lot of ethical issues involved. And so definitely something to think about. If we develop, uh, developing that type of platform is important to do but there's a lot of other thinking involved. For example, the ASL sign bank. When we have a video come up, we, have, we put it in the sign bank and then we have to label it. But one person isn't representative of the entire community's use of that language. Right, So right. if we made an app where, you know, we ask people, what's your sign for this? And then people were able to reply, how do we evaluate? those replies? Do we do a rating system? And that brings up possible issues um, with negativity. Because those issues of language are hot and can be traumatizing for many people. And so how is that something that we navigate in terms of crowdsourcing? I'm not sure exactly. So my answer is yes, but to do so with care reflectiveness and to go slowly.
which is another thing about tech is that tech is always evolving and it's, you know, it's like, hurry up and do this documentation. But at the same time, sometimes we have to take a, take a step back, make sure that we involve everyone in the conversation, because when we're in a rush to do things, that can be damaging in and of itself. We have to take time to reflect with transparency, engaging in an open dialogue. And will we think of everything? Of course not. But in the end, it'll be much more equitable. Yes. And I think now we're seeing this with AI more generally. We're recognizing the racist and ableist elements that are part in, that are built in to AI powered software because these assumptions were made when, assumptions were made when creating these technologies and varying perceptive perceptions were not incorporated or considered. So we must be more methodical. And at the same time, people have a very strong sense of urgency in terms of their expectation of when technology should like these should be developed. So how close we are, are we to achieving that? I mean, how can we go faster without sacrificing the kind of ethical decisions that need to be considered behind this kind of technological development. I mean, it's definitely a balance. Put people like us in charge. Well, I guess, yes, that's definitely the, the way funding to go. That we need you to are do this not work. wrong. Yeah. I mean, thinking about ethics, respect for people and their data. I mentioned before, and I know we're out of time, but I wanted to mention something that came up before. Data is power, and that's so true. And producing that data is power too. And so as we do so, we need to do so very carefully. I think my crest fest establishing this network, I mean, I think about yes. when I was younger, I had this, these burning questions and there was this nobody dialogue. Right. And so I think that this will really set the stage for training awareness and it'll elevate that pipeline and help us to do things not necessarily faster, but more broadly. And so we can start moving forward with chaos. Yes. yes. We're almost running out of time now. I'm not sure how many more questions we'll be able to address. Let's see. to see what's remaining in the QA. Any questions we haven't addressed yet? We have some big, big topics here. How do we even start? Thoughts, Julie? I think connected to what we just said, I think it would be great to answer some of these short questions. Obviously we have technology out there, YouTube, and is it okay to mine that? It goes back to our previous discussion. In our work as researchers, we really need to think about things like informed consent. And when people upload information online, they typically view their upload for a specific purpose. And then when it's taken, it becomes somebody else or something else, and there's no informed consent involved. So I get the allure of doing that. The internet is amazing and has so much there to offer. But at the same time, if it was me, I would prefer doing some due diligence. And we've talked about this within our group, especially in the Slash Research Project, about getting people's consent. It is time intensive. It's not logistically easy. You have to find these individuals, ask them. You also have to think about when you get that data, you don't always have access to the metadata. And so sometimes that can right. invalidate the information, especially on YouTube. If a tech company uh, takes anything that has a hashtag of ASL, they have to think about who is producing these videos. Are they, they ASL1 students uploading videos for their teachers. 
and then being mined as true ASL, that's something that we really have to be careful about. We have to think about data mining and how important that is in terms of power dynamics. And that the communities who, for whom this is their language are not necessarily involved. In terms of major languages like English or Japanese, this might not be as relevant of an issue, but with linguistic minorities, we need to be much more careful that people who are not from those specific communities, how they approach their interactions, how they approach confidentiality, and that to make sure these communities are provided with a voice to express what is appropriate and what's not. I see many parallels with documenting of indigenous languages, finding out later that the communities are upset with some of the resources they have because they don't necessarily want certain forms of documentation used for all purposes. So this is an extra level of mindfulness that not all lang languages are on equal footing with regards to power, autonomy, as well as dynamics with different governments or different systems. And I think that that definitely needs to be considered with our work going forward. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's historically been part of documentation. I know Hi. we're out of time. Hi everyone. Hi, our time has just gone by very quickly. And I want to thank you all and thank you both so much for this very rich, amazing conversation, truly fascinating. I've already learned so much. And I think our audience also has really appreciated and we'd be willing to stay even longer if we could, but we do have a time constraint and we do need to close. So thank you all for joining us today. And especially to the both of you for allowing us to get an inside glimpse of your conversation, the ideas you're having and what you're working on and what's in development. Thanks for having us. This event, like I said before, this is actually our fourth event in the series of Crest Fest events. We have another exciting event tomorrow. It's our panel discussion. And there will be a few people joining for the hot topics in sign language technology panel. And we're very excited and hope to see many of you there tomorrow. Again, thank you both so much for accepting our invitation. And with that, see you all at the next one. Take care. It's an honor.